brother, 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 brother Pete, but the brother Pete is like family to me. You know, his father was the great Joseph Buttigieg who translated Antonio Gramsci. He was the Dean of Humanities at, at, at Notre Dame, and he was like a blood brother with me. We used to go to Italy every summer. And so I remember Pete when he was in diapers. I remember I gave him his first five dollar deep bill right in his diaper. So I love that brother as family, you see. And so I see him, I give him a hug. I said, please give me a hug to Ann. Brother Joseph died a year ago and so forth. But I tell Peter up front. I said, now you know when it comes to the legacy of Gramsci, Brother Pete wrote his senior thesis on who? Does anybody know who he wrote it on? He wrote it on Brother Bernie as exemplar of integrity. He lived in my same room as a freshman at Harvard, Hallworthy 8. We lived in the same room, but 35 years difference, you see. So he's like family, but I'm just honest with him. I say, brother, now you know I can't support you. <laughs> I love you to death, you're gonna be a member of the family all, but you just part of that same milk toast neoliberal crowd I've been critical of all this time. I can't support you, brother. Not at all, you see. Now, is he better than Trump? Of course he's better than Trump. All of y'all better than, I mean, the, <laughs> the bar is about this low. The Michael Brooks. Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show, Keystone Cops Edition. We're broadcasting live from downtown Brooklyn, USA, where Bernie won Iowa, he won New Hampshire, and he's going to win Nevada with super producer Matt Leck. Uh, Bloomberg was a racist, or is a racist, is. I guess. Present tense, present tense, he's, present he's tense. still with us, actually. Yeah. Chief Economist David Griskin. How's it going? On this week's program, of the great crystal ball in the state of the race, Bernie plummeting to first, the sad demise of Elizabeth Warren, the existential threat to democracy of Mike Bloomberg, then Malika Jabali. She's joining us to talk about her fascinating new documentary, Left Out. What do working class black voters want, need, and care about across the industrial Midwest of this country? She did something novel. She went and found out, made a great documentary about it. We'll be talking about that. Also, Mike Bloomberg, how he's buying support and what that says about the broader institutional problems in the United States. We've got a gem with David Griscom, as we always do. Sinn Féin with historical breakthrough election results in Ireland. A debunk as always with the great Ben Burgess and we're going full court press here. Mike Bloomberg, we don't want an election that is a choice between clown fascist thuggery and authoritarianism and the Singaporeization of the world. And if I can mimic Cornell West for a second, we love Singapore. We have much to learn from Singapore, but we do not want that model. That's what Mike Bloomberg represents. In addition to being an oligarch, a racist, and an agent of surveillance, spying, control, behavioral modification, and plutocracy. We've got to be very clear about this. Shout out to our great friend, Abby Martin, taking on the suppression of free speech and advocacy for the rights and dignity, dignity of the Palestinian people. All that. And much, much more on this week's Michael Brooks show. But first, let's talk about what happened in Iowa. Bernie Sanders won. Do these margins need to get bigger? Absolutely. No doubt. And I think Bernie is going to need to make some adjustments. There's going to need to be more surrogates that speak to rural and older voters uh, and a broader set of the population. We're going to need to be talking with people who might be military vets, who might be small business owners. There's no contradiction between a radical, humane, and universal program and queuing into people's sense of Americanness. That's why he's going to need to retrieve some of the good Harvey K, Harvey JK stuff. We're going to need to be hearing about Roosevelt, Rokana talking about completing the New Deal. This is going to help him 
run up the margins with the older voters, which is going to be incredibly important. And at the same time, he's going to continue to win. And the press is going to freak out and the war against him from the political establishment and the oligarchy will go in full blast. We need to be ready for this. We need to be ready for this in a multitude of ways. We have momentum. And that is despite all of the work against us in the Sanders campaign. These people in the elite punditocracy are wrong for a living. They were wrong about Iraq. They were wrong about Wall Street. They were wrong about Hillary Clinton. And they were wrong about Biden. They will be wrong about Pete. And we will make them wrong about Mike Bloomberg. We can't look to corporate media for support. Look at how even supposedly unbiased outlets like Reuters reported on Bernie's victory last night. This is Reuters. This is the headline of the evening. Pete Buttigieg's, Buttigieg finishes second in New Hampshire. Amy Klobuchar third. Now, why, of course, would you mention uh, the much more shabby first place finish of Bernie Sanders, who, of course, received the most votes and won New Hampshire? Our supposed friend and ally, Elizabeth Warren, used her humiliating defeat in New Hampshire to take cheap shots at the Sanders coalition. But the fight between factions in our party has taken a sharp turn in recent weeks with ads mocking other candidates and with supporters of some candidates shouting curses at other Democratic candidates. These harsh tactics might work if you are willing to burn down the rest of the party in order to be the last man standing. They might work if you don't worry about leaving our party and our politics worse off than how you found it. And they might work if you think only you have all the answers and only you are the solution to all our problems. This is a narcissistic message for people in the managerial class more concerned about their own feelings on Twitter than about the urgent crisis that hits so many people today. This is what Bernie Sanders is talking to. He's talking to people who could die without medical care. He's talking about poverty. He's talking about the real and persistent crises that define this country. Now, there is no doubt that there is a broader cultural problem that has some truth to it. Is this isn't shouldn't just be the province of the of the scolds and the civility addicts. Of course, people need to figure out how to be humane on social media. Of course, there is going to need to be an effort to reach out with respect and to dignity to those who are earnest in their politics and can be persuaded. But for those who would throw away the fight for single payer health care because of a meme they didn't like. Nothing could be a fuller expression of vanity, narcissism, delusion, and comfort. And we cannot indulge that. We also need to recognize that the disingenuity of unity rhetoric was always used as a cudgel to hold the Sanders campaign and movement to a double standard. The reality is, is if you want unity and you want positivity, then the Warren campaign is not putting out MSNBC's talking points to devalue the working class Sanders coalition. And if you want unity and beating Trump is the only thing that matters, then Bernie Sanders will be spoken about positively on television, along with Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg and Elizabeth Warren. But clearly it's not. It's a double standard and it's a double standard that we're not going to abide by because this race is about the existential fate of our democracy and the basic capacity to deliver basic human decency and delivery in the 21st century. The stakes are really high and they're not about what particular form of humor you appreciate or not. The fighting against the democratic establishment is nothing compared to the fight we will face against the Republican party. They fought tooth and nail to prevent Obama's moderate agenda from falling into place. And we won't beat them with half measures. We won't beat them with a Democratic establishment more interested in destroying Bernie Sanders than in actually wielding power and defeating Donald Trump. So we shouldn't accept these attacks. We have to push back against the lies and slander of the Sanders and his movement. We are in the lead and we cannot slow down now. now I want to talk for a few minutes very specifically about Medicare for all. The message on this needs to be sharpened up by the Sanders campaign. The clear humanitarian case of single payer health care, get getting rid of parasite insurance companies is absolutely morally indisputable. 
At the same time, we do know that people are motivated by loss aversion. And many people in this society, and I say this as somebody who grew up in a lot of financial poverty, there is a apprehension and fear of change on economic issues and things as fundamental as healthcare if you've had those hard fought gains. That's why we're seeing the main propaganda campaign against Sanders and Nevada from the machine union politicians and organizers who are trying to suppress the working class movement in Nevada is a fear mongering campaign about single payer. We're going to see Pete Buttigieg take his money from billionaires and lie and lie and lie and distort and distort and distort about health care. The moral case is unimpeachable. But what we need to do a lot more of is be clear here, and we're going to play a clip of Nina Turner starting to do this in a second, that your health care is not stable as long as it is in the hands of your employer. It doesn't matter what concessions you've won. And we all know that structurally labor has been losing for decades, not only in the United States, but internationally. And in fact, if you care about your union and your hard fought gains and having some power over the predator corporations that control many of our lives, you know that you need to take health care off of the table. That is the terrain of where the argument about single payer needs to go. Nina Turner points to this a bit here. The senator will continue to communicate health care for all. Universal health care is a fundamental right in this country. And what we have to do is a deeper job in helping people who have that health care through a job understand that it's always tenuous. You can be fired at any moment. Your employer can change your insurance at any moment. So why not join with the rest of your sisters and brothers in this country and help to guarantee health care as a human right and not have the union see that as a threat against something that they have. That is the fundamental truth. We saw that with striker, uh, with people striking for GM several months ago. The company put health care on the table, threatened children's lives, threatened people's medicine. Because it's not about efficiency. It's about power. And in order to revitalize the labor union movement, we need to take health care off the table. And we need to make single payer universal health care the tip of the spear for a reinvigorated labor fight along class lines in this country. And they need to explain that that is the nature of the fight. And that ultimately will protect you from these predators that threaten your well-being. All right, folks, um, let's actually get pretty quickly to the shout out. Shout out, shout out, shout out. My brain is still in recovery mode. Shout out, shout out. Shout it's nice to hear this over the Bell House uh, speakers on Friday. Mode. That was an incredible, by the way, out, incredible out, show at the Bell House. Major, uh, that, that felt like just such an incredible accomplishment, especially because there are honestly so many new people there. I like talking about ideas. High level. The exchange of ideas. Shout out, shout out. High level. Still in recovery mode. Looking forward to sharing more ideas. Uh, well, we were all actually saying that we liked uh, we liked Weinstein less than Ruben earlier in oh, our one hundred one hundred percent. That guy's a shithead. Um, all right, Dave oh, Ruben's way funnier uh, unintentionally. Definitely. Um, and actually, you know what? Have that cover ready for when we go to the pitch, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, folks, our friend Abby Martin, who's been on the show, she'll be back on the show again soon. And she will also be with us uh, April 3rd at the North Door in Austin, Texas. Grab your tickets, TMBS Live, April 3rd, Austin, Texas. She's a journalist uh, who, and commentator and analyst. You're very familiar with her work, I'm sure. Her Empire Files work is some of the most courageous and important journalism in the game on the nature of U.S. foreign policy and the bloodshed and cruelty that it creates across the globe. She's done a lot of work on the barbarism of what Israel does to Gaza, the absolute obscenity of Israeli policy in the Middle East, the mass killings, the suppression, the denial of basic necessities of life. A couple of years ago, she was invited to speak at the University of Georgia, uh, at the uh, Georgia, Georgia Southern, Southern University, University, excuse me. 
and she refused to sign a pledge before speaking uh, that basically uh, pledged that she would not engage in uh, boycott divestment of sanctions against Israel. These are state prohibitions that have been passing on state level across the country, banning people. And basically it, protributes, uh, it prohibits contracts of exceeding $1,000 if any company or individual that engage in a boycott of Israel. Martin said she was supposed to be paid $1,000. I'm quoting now from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. So now she, of course, was denied the right to speak because of this. And she is filing a lawsuit on free speech grounds uh, in association with CARE. And again, nothing but solidarity support for her. Let's play a clip of her at the press conference uh, suing the state of Georgia over the Israel loyalty oath law. Life. In my personal life, I am politically active against issues of racism and injustice. This is of great moral importance to me. To be made to choose between my career that I have built my entire adult life around and my political convic convictions, which are of invaluable importance to me, and a right supposed to be protected by the U.S. Constitution is an outrage and is ex unacceptable to me as an American citizen. I want to reiterate, situations of oppression, racism, injustice, and violations of international law that are funded by my tax dollars is something I care very deeply about. They are ideals that I've centered my entire life around. Like anyone who has deeply held moral or spiritual beliefs, I should not be expected to throw them away in order to simply work in the state of Georgia. Apart from my right to free speech, it was my right to peaceful protest, my right to boycott, and not just mine, but the constitutional rights of every independent contractor of all types who want to work in this state cannot be held with such disregard by the Georgia legal system. My aim here. So nothing but props to Abby. Uh, it's incredible. We support her. We look forward to talking with her more about it. This is something that threatens everybody's right. Uh, and more broadly, I'll say, look, I, I, the left needs to get back on board with really robust free speech across the board, both in the formal legal sense, but also uh, in the informal sense as well. We need to recognize that the weapon, a, wep, that opposition to free speech ultimately, whether it is in a corporate context, an academic context, or even, or of course, most especially in a formal legal context, which this Israel lo loyalty oath brings into play, which makes it far more serious, but all on a continuum. Well, ultimately, first of all, we have confidence in the power of what we're putting forward and we can win. Secondly, it's always going to hurt and undermine the left. Look at how rightly going after social media's empowerment of racism and Nazism and fascism, which absolutely needed to happen, which turned into a whole other, a whole other form of unaccountable secretive control and bureaucracy, hurting all independent media. We need to have something that is structural and strategic and actions like this and the enormous courage that Abby's putting out here, in addition to her indispensable work on Israel-Palestine, is exactly the right spirit. So shout out to her. All right. Let's uh, do a little pitch here. Got uh, some news to kind of get a little, little music to bed this, maybe. And then we'll, we'll get to the Crystal Ball interview in a second. We recorded with Crystal just a little over an hour before, but we're going to uh, just start by saying... Become a patron, patreon.com slash TMBS. You get two to one extra content and we're ramping up here. The goal at a base sustainable level is to get between 5,000 and ideally 6,000 patrons to sustain and grow out all the things we're planning, including books, including a different type of uh, uh, space and setup and um, other things that we need uh, to provide more content, to really fill out everything we're doing. That's the next phase through the election and beyond. And the way we do it, and the way we do absolutely every single thing we do, is by you becoming a patron. So join today, patreon.com slash TMBS. April 3rd, we're at the North Door in Austin, Texas. There's links uh, in the show. Uh, if you're listening on, uh, in, on uh, 
iTunes. There's a link in the show description. There's a link in the show description on YouTube. You can go snag your tickets today at the North Door, April 3rd, Austin, Texas, with Anna Kasparian and the great Abby Martin, the great Anna. And Abby, that's going to be an incredible show. And they're going uh, really quick. We're over a third sold out. And these are now selling out now uh, in general. So I would go get those tickets as quickly as possible. Uh, TMBS.FM is the way to keep can, uh, handle on everything, including buying merch. And I want to share this image with you guys. Uh, Matt, do you have it? The thing I forwarded you. So, folks, people keep asking me about this stuff. We don't have an exact release date yet, but I do want to show you that this is getting really close. So, and and in the future, we're going to be releasing our own books, um, which I'm really excited about. It's a whole other hurdle of work, um, but I think it's another really important way of distributing things um, and getting information out there. So you'll be learning more about that in the coming weeks. But uh, here is the cover, Andrew J. World great talented artist and friend of show did this this is my upcoming zero books cover against the web the cosmopolitan answer to the new right and that is this is going to be coming out uh either in late february or in march i'll let you of course know as soon as you can pre-order it and here it is that's me overseeing the dark web <laughs> i think that cover is awesome i'm really excited about this i'm very excited about this book it's an answer to a certain type of right-wing politics, which is embodied by the dark web, but it manifests in many different ways, even beyond that particular uh, pop culture moment in 2018. Uh, and the answer that I'm putting forward with this cosmopolitan socialist case is really a big part of what I believe um, in terms of the type of kind of left synthesis that is fit for purpose for creating a humane and more successful and healthy culture inside the left. And of course, doing the main thing that we have to do, winning, uh, or else which all the rest of it is, you know, is just noise. So um, patreon.com slash TMBS. Folks, brief break. We'll be right back with Crystal Ball and then after Crystal, Jem and Malika Jabali. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now friend of show crystal ball she's co-host of rising on the hill she's author of the populist co-author with sagar and jetty of popular the populist guide to 2020 i don't know why that's so hard i'm going to be with them at the bell house march 7th that's going to be fun there recently right what was it like that was an incredible show yeah i mean the, the energy was great i love doing these live shows and i'm really excited i'm really excited for our next one in austin Oh, you're doing one in Austin. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. We're trying to get an Austin date on the calendar. Um, we just did our first one ever in LA. It was like our book launch. How'd event, it go? And it was just so freaking fun. So yeah. And thank you for helping me like figure all of that out. So of course. yeah, it's, it's natural. We had a great time in Philly. Um, that was another, but no, it's awesome to, you know, to have like, as an example, to have a guy come up to me and say, like, my father's from Haiti. I, sh I send him your segments on Haiti. It, uh, it makes wow. him feel like he's connected to the island. Like, that's amazing. Wow. That's such an honor. That is so cool. Yeah, to see in person, like, what it means to people, the work that you're doing. And also, like, it's very reciprocal because I oh. feel very grateful to the people that, that support you and that watch us and are part of this whole community, too. We had two guys from L.A. from New Zealand to see our show, which just like blew my mind, but that, you know, this was part of their routine and part of something that was like important to them and in their relationship and whatever. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. I remember the show once. Uh, just, yeah. It's yeah. really awesome. We've had people fly from, from overseas and you're always like, all right, I'm just going <laughs> to be a good listen. show. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. All right, Crystal. Well, you and I are both making the best of it. And people might be surprised because, look, I'm I'm a very strong Bernie supporter. You're at the very least extremely Bernie sympathetic. And uh, it was a tough night for us because our candidate won New Hampshire. I know. I mean, I don't think I don't think we can ignore the reality of how poorly he performed, you know, plummeting into first place there. I was uh, I was relieved to see that he didn't just drop out right away <laughs> in his victory speech. Um, and I think we all have to say that the, the real winner 
And um, I think we should probably call her the front runner at this point is, is Amy Klobuchar. I mean, she had that strong fifth place showing in Iowa uh, and now surging into an even stronger third place. Um, sure, she's at zero percent with black voters, but I fully expect that once they have uh, Amy Klobuchar beaten to their heads one more time, <laughs> that's all going to turn right around. That three percent that she's sitting at in, you know, Super Tuesday states, that's all going to change. I can feel it on the cusp. And I'm just, you know, I'm deeply sorry that that Bernie Sanders was only able to win uh, the primary in New Hampshire and win the most votes in Iowa. I couldn't be more disappointed in his performance. Yeah, it's a super bummer. I, all right. In a, in a, in a few minutes, I do want to get to some things I think that the Sanders campaign could strengthen. But that being said, the reality is out of the gate is that he has won by proper metrics the first two primary states. His lead nationally is increasing. And the people that they are positioning against him, in irony of all ironies, are number one for people who uh, pose as sort of being woke and concerned about uh, race and racism, as an example. They are putting forward a viciously like an authoritarian Republican. That's what Mike Bloomberg is truly with a profoundly racist record, a guy who ran a college town and still managed to have a highly racist and racialized record. And Amy Klobuchar, we're going to start digging into her record as a DA. Not only uh, this, uh, this case that the NAACP in Minneapolis has highlighted about somebody that she convicted a young man with zero DNA, no material, uh, material evidence, uh, and actually several sort of contradictory pieces of witness testimony. We also have on, and this is this is more minor, but it just to me really underlines so much that she went after Somali immigrants for a, like a minor stimulant. I think it's called cot. It's like basically yeah. like chewing tobacco or drinking right. coffee. Like that's the type of shit that anybody would know if a Republican did that. That's obviously anti-immigrant, racist stuff so and it's fairness, obvious why she was doing it and in fairness we would have known about it and we'd have talked about it a lot more if kamala harris had done it too because she had that moment where she got the front runner treatment and there was some actual scrutiny of what she had done there's never been you know there's all the like all these articles about how oh bernie sanders has never been vetted which is like so ridiculous and stupid. The man's been in public life forever. He's already gone through one presidential cycle. It's just that all of your stupid things that you think the public is going to be so freaked out about, they actually don't care about his essay in 1974 or whatever they want to throw at him. Amy right. Klobuchar really hasn't been vetted. I haven't seen one. The only critical piece about her really was in the very early days before it was clear she wasn't going to get much traction in the polls when they dug into her relationship with her staff or incredibly abusive behavior to her workers throwing staplers and hitting them with binders and you know the whole the whole comb salad incident which oh, you know I can't ever get out of my mind so disgusting man after that that was pretty much it and i think it was it's partly because she has never really been, you know, in that front runner seat or even challenging for it. And it's also partly because there was some blowback from that coverage where it was like, oh, you wouldn't cover a man this way. I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think a man should be covered that way. I think that the way that they treat their staff is is deeply relevant, especially if you care about working people and, and policies and people who are going to elevate them. Well, not only that, but I mean, I my stance on these things is very strongly in the if people acknowledge and grow, we should encourage that across the board. So quite honestly, as somebody who obviously doesn't like Amy Klobuchar in any, you know, I have no resonance with her in any way, shape or form. If she came out and she said, look, I did this really, you know, this was awful. I've learned I apologize. I implemented these changes. She didn't do that. She actually said, me terrorizing the people that work under me is going to help prepare me for dealing with Russia, which is sophomoric <laughs> and disgusting. And people not only and, and also, I, I frankly, like, I, I don't buy it. That was just utterly cynical. Like, no, in today's environment, uh, no, in fact, it would be it, no, it would certainly be detrimental and people would talk about it if if anybody treated their staff that way as they should. And yeah. my point being, though, is that she didn't she didn't use it as an opportunity to say, I've you know, I've grown as a person, which we should encourage in everybody. 
Uh, right. She used it to kind of like glibly dismiss it. And then the New York Times and their endorsement criticized her on it, but they criticized her because they basically were like, you know, she's so abusive that only like dumb people would go work for her, which, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not really either the point or how that works, but whatever. Um, uh, it is funny though, to me, you know, in our coverage last night, um, Rachel Bovard was on the panel and she made maybe the best point. She was like, all these people are irrelevant. Pete is not going to be the nominee. Amy's not going to be the nominee. Elizabeth Warren's not going to be the nominee. Joe Biden's not going to be the nominee. The only two people who are really left that are relevant are Bernie Sanders and Michael Bloomberg. And I would say I would the one caveat I would add to that is that all the other people are relevant only in so much as they stay in the race and continue to divide the vote and but to basically distract the media and the Democratic establishment from realizing how much trouble they are in today. Because, and I know you saw this, I mean, and this was part of our joking at the beginning, like, it's hilarious to me the way that I knew going into both Iowa and New Hampshire, it didn't matter if Bernie won, it would be written off the state's too white or the margins too narrow, or, you know, it was, he has a ceiling or whatever it is. And they are fooling themselves because the the truth of the matter is that these two states were actually very challenging for him demographically. Yes, home state, of senator advantage, whatever. You can ask Elizabeth Warren how significant of a factor that ultimately right. is. But Bernie Sanders, again, because the media doesn't acknowledge this, has the most diverse coalition. And so as things move out west, out to more diverse states, out to younger states, he has a much better, stronger hand to play but I think they're deluding themselves still into maintaining this 2016 caricature that it's only white people that support Bernie, when it's actually exactly the opposite. Amy and Pete have all these college-educated white people that support them. That is their strongest demographic. And that is the demographic that's been moving between all of these different media-generated candidates. But when you get behind these predominantly white states, there's just not enough college-educated white people to you know, put you up in first or second place. This is for you. Not enough people with gluten sensitivity to <laughs> carry over all of the annoying candidates. Not enough of a constituency of adults who do Harry Potter spells. Um, <laughs> What's the oat milk? You know, oat milk. Oat you know, milk. Like, about? <laughs> the oat milk constituency. I mean, Elizabeth Warren's email to her supporters was like a, you know, you've just been through a bad breakup. I mean, it, I, I don't look. I don't know what to say. I. I, you know, can we talk about Elizabeth Warren for a minute? Because, yes, please. And can you say all the things I want to say? Because people are well, already very I'm, touchy about me criticizing her. I'm more in, in I'm in a place of sort of sadness for her at this point because yeah. I looked back, you know, I don't know if you saw this piece that I did. It got a lot of attention when I was at MSNBC. Mm -hmm. It was February 2014, almost exact. It was six years ago yesterday when I said Hillary Clinton will be a disaster she was sat on the freaking Walmart board, all these paid speeches to Goldman Sachs, her husband deregulated everything. I mean, this is not the right candidate for right now. And I said, but the person that we really need is Elizabeth Warren. She's the only one who's been challenging the Obama administration on, you know, Larry Summers and these other Wall Street appointees. She wakes up the morning and wants to fight for the middle class and people say she's too liberal. I think that's ridiculous. She has an economic populist message that could resonate. And I don't think I was delusional at that point. I think, you know, having spoken to people who were her staffers, people who fought for her election to the Senate, she was that person who was really an economic populist first and someone willing to buck the establishment and pay a real price for it. I mean, that was a big deal to go up against Obama back in those days for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that... First of all, I think that if she had run, like I urged her to, back in 2016, I honestly think she'd be the president right now. If she had run yeah. that kind of campaign, it was the moment for her. And as Sanders showed, there was a real opening um, for an alternative to Hillary. He was going to stay out if she ran, as I'm sure that you know. He asked her to run and then only you know, got in himself when she decided not to. So first of all, I think she would have been president. But then when she didn't run and she played the endorsement process so politically and did not back her brother in the movement, who's supposed to be her ally in the movement, who shares her vision, shares her policies, had been a supposed friend. When she played that so politically, I think that choice 
has set up everything since then. Because the moment that you make that decision, when you talk yourself into this idea that, well, if I play the political chess game, right, if I make the politically calculated decision, it lines me up better to get into power. And that's the thing that's really going to help people. That is the road to hell. That is how you end up with all these freaking people, so many of them in Washington, who think that they came here really to do something, but then the instant they get here, they conform to the system and they sell out and they defer to power, all in the service of, well, that'll help me get better positioned so that maybe sometime in the future, I can deliver the things that I really want. And when she made that choice, I don't think that it's ever... I don't think it's ever been the same for her. And so then you see this campaign unfold where she brings on Clinton advisors. She decides to try to, you know, be a team player uh, with the Democratic establishment. She ultimately, when she has a chance to, to go after Biden here at the end, you know, she had a chance to really take him to task with a bankruptcy bill, which is a big part of why she even got into politics. Right. And instead of doing that, she turns around and knives Bernie Sanders in the back smearing him as a secret sexist, her supposed friend on this identity issue and paints herself as like the, you know, the pussy hat candidate with the pink scarf, right. completely right. abandoning the middle class economic working class policies that had brought her into public life. You know, it just honestly, I, it, it, at this point, it just makes me sad because she was a warrior and she was an ally and she just isn't anymore. I agree with everything you said. And we would have fought so hard for her in 2016. But I 100%. I just want to. But my I think the problem is, though, among many things, is that she just doesn't have a very. I, ironically, because of the whole like plan branding and she knows everything and she wrote all these blog posts, I think that she has a sincere background and a real commitment to some extent that has been tempered clearly by her development in politics. But she has an understanding of certain Wall Street economic populism issues, no doubt. That's why she got into the game. OK, absolutely. Then I think there's a whole other slew of issues that she was basically just willing to say, like, all right, you know, whatever the trendy, you know, pseudo woke consultant packaging is, I guess. And yeah. then a whole bunch of other issues where, frankly, the path of least resistance is, you know, it's the opposite of the pseudo woke stuff. It's like, no, I will be a point person for Raytheon. I will vote for Trump's military budgets. I will. And and so to me, and that reflects, you know, again, she just wasn't a comprehensive candidate, but it also showed that so many people uh, were are, we're still framing progressive politics or whatever, you know, progressive, I think, is kind of dead as a term. But left wing politics or populist politics has to have some comprehensive vision of the world. And I think that she just doesn't have that. And frankly, you even need to have that even if you aren't, you know, even if you're, you know, Obama, he had a thread about what what does the country mean? What is the what? How are we transitioning it? Bill Clinton had the third way, right? Like these are projects I don't agree with, but right. uh, but she does not have that. And this endless yeah. fighting and complaining. I mean, I to see her supporters actually be complaining that the media isn't giving her enough time is that's where sadness goes and just not even anger, just like genuine disbelief sets in for me. I don't know how people can be so deluded. Yeah, I think that's all right. And I think what you said in particular about her not being a comprehensive candidate, she has she has a specialty. Right. right. And it's a really important specialty. Right. And she did a lot of good setting up the CFPB, fighting, you know, some of those bad nominations, et cetera. That specialty is really, really important. But and maybe this is because she did come up as a Republican, um, because, you know, she didn't have a lifetime of grappling with these issues, watching how they intersect with public events as they're unfolding. She never had uh, that sort of comprehensive vision that she could then fall back on or those even those comprehensive values yeah. that you could ultimately fall back on in a situation that's new and novel. And so instead she, you know, brought on the typical like DC consultant types and had them give her a briefing book and just parroted whatever she was supposed to say in those areas. Um, and, but I, I do think in terms of, look, she's got terrible political instincts. That is 
just 100% true. But also, if you're a certain kind of candidate, you don't necessarily need political instincts, right? right. If you have um, in a, a, a real if you're really in touch with your own core values and vision, then you don't need political instinct because that's what's ultimately guiding you. And um, I don't know that she, I guess she never had that as solidly as I had thought and hoped that she did back when I was urging her to run in 2014. And so again, I, I mean, look, she's in, she's not having a good time right now. Um, I think it's it's near the end for her. There's reports that she pulled down her ads in Nevada and South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she's making the last stand in California or what. But, um, you know, to me, it is a real loss that someone who I thought was an ally so clearly is not. No doubt. I just want to hit two other uh, quick things with you. One... Um, I have some ideas about this, but what? Okay, we got to thread this needle. Bernie is doing really well. He won the first two states. He's growing in the polls and the media is lying about it and trying to suppress that reality. On the other hand, he needs to win by by, by bigger margins and he needs to turn these uh, vote participation rates up. So what can he do? You know, I honestly think that that's all going to come naturally. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, right, what did we learn in Iowa and New Hampshire? First of all, we learned that 70% of the Democratic electorate supports Medicare for all. We know from poll after poll in every state I've ever seen that Bernie Sanders is the most trusted candidate on both health care and climate, which are the number one and number two issues, respectively. His favorability ratings with Democrats are great. People like him. They like him on the issues. They trust him, right? Really important. They trust him that he's going to fight for what he says he's going to fight for and that he's telling them the truth. All of that is great. The only thing that has held him back, in my view, is the, the decades of propaganda saying that he's unelectable. Mm -hmm. And what I, think, what I think is going to happen is as he continues to win, it becomes much harder to make the case that the guy who is winning all the time is unelectable. Just like, I mean, it's just the Barack Obama path in 2008, right? Of course, the media actually gave him credit for his wins, so it had a bigger instant impact. But you see it in the national polls. You see it in the Super Tuesday polls, where Bernie is now has a sizable lead over Joe Biden, who's in second, who's 27, um, 20. So I, I think that is already happening. Don't lose sight of the fact that the demographics in these two very white states were very favorable to the um, more moderate establishment candidates. The devil candidates. <laughs> Those ones. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Who, look, the, the like white liberals, all they want is to win. That's mm -hmm. all they care about. Just win. That's it. And so whoever the media tells them is going to win. That's who they're going to go with. And that's why they're jumping all around. Somebody has a good debate. Oh, let me go to them. Somebody starts. Let's go to them. And eventually, I do believe that as they see, oh, not only did he win, not only did he win again, oh, now we've gone to a diverse state and has the most diverse coalition and he wins. Eventually, there is going to be a tipping point where people go have the they feel the permission to vote for the guy that they already like, trust and support on the issue. So. I think that they're in a good spot. I really do. And you know I wouldn't sugarcoat it if I thought otherwise. I would say otherwise. I really think they just need to run the plan. They've got a much better ground game in place, especially in the Latino community than any other campaign. Um, and so Nevada will be a real test of, of how that turns, you know, if that really delivers for them and they're able to, to uh, turn out the vote that they've been wanting to in that state. Zed Jelani, uh, who we have on our show a good bit and who I think is really, really smart, um, said that I, I saw him tweeting this, which is all, where all great wisdom is found, um, <laughs> that, you know, maybe the case is that Bernie doesn't need to turn out mass amounts of brand new voters because the voters that are already voting like him and it's enough. Um, with that coalition now, there was a similarly brilliant person on your show election night who oh, immediately yeah. made this spin when a very eager Sagar and Jetty was just like, you're a Bernie guy. What about the increased voter participation? I was That's like, great. he's winning with the traditional voters, bro. Sounds yeah, good to me. That's a good thing. But I also don't think that we fully know what that all looks like or even 
how much turnout in the primary translates to turnout in the general election. I mean, these things are kind of tangential to me. But Nevada will be a test of if the diverse coalition that we see coming together and that we had little inklings of um, strength in Iowa and New Hampshire if that really comes out when there's more competition for it in Nevada, California, et cetera. Final question. Mike Bloomberg is finally starting to get a little bit focused on the last couple of days. Uh, our buddy Benjamin Dixon revealed this. I mean, I, I can't even I mean, <laughs> not to even reduce it to just the Sanders thing, because it's much bigger than that. But it it is incredible. Like, let's parse, you know, Bernie's body language versus the most objectively racist statement a frontline politician has made outside of Donald Trump in modern politics, arguably, and people are spinning it, justifying a racist policy, which he oversaw that terrorized basically young black and Hispanic men across this entire city for three terms. Uh, yeah. You know, so look, he's got money, he's got media, he can buy a whole bunch of people off, uh, but his record is obscene. So what does that collision course look like to you? I go back and forth on this a little bit. I mean, on the one hand, I do. I see people who were colleagues at MSNBC who were outraged at these policies when they were unfolding when I was at the network and, you know, outright activists against it who are now like, oh, well, but also, you know, the crime bill back in 1992. So let's just forgive and forget, mm -hmm. right? Just equating, I mean, it, just creating this false equivalency that is, distressing and bizarre. The amount of caping for billionaires going on in MSNBC these days is, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but it's still distressing to me. Look, I think that there is a constituency, obviously, in the Democratic Party that was backing Joe Biden that is like, let's just win. Don't care who, don't care what he's done, don't care if he's like half sentient, who can win, let's just win. And Bloomberg makes a good, it's not a real case, but he makes a good fake case for, I'm the mayor, I was competent, I'm tough. Even Joy Ann Reed on MSNBC was saying, oh, well, he a, was a Republican. That's a great thing because that knows he, that means he knows how to reach out to Republicans. So they just mm. want to win. Russian must have made her say that. <laughs> must have been. Yeah. Time traveling Russian hackers, right? Mm -hmm. Um. On the other hand, I was heartened to see Andrew Gillum, who's more of an establishment yeah. figure at this point, come out very hard uh, against Bloomberg's comments. And I saw others who I would consider establishment, same thing. So I think it will be ultimately hard for white suburban people in particular, honestly, to vote for someone they feel like is a racist. Um, you know, frankly, I think a lot of African-American people have had to suck it up and vote for less than ideal candidates that they felt were basically racist in the past. And so Absolutely. in a way, yeah. it's, it's almost not as doesn't land as hard with them as with white people who don't want to be seen as or feel like they're voting for um, for a racist, which is, look, that's a good thing. I don't want white people feeling like they should be able to vote for racist. So I think he's a little bit overblown right now. I think the primary purpose he's serving in the primary at this point, um, no pun intended there, is to keep Democratic establishment and donor types from freaking out about Bernie Sanders' ascendance in the way that they really should, because they've got this Mike Bloomberg safety valve. And I can tell you, I've, I've had you know, I have friends in this in the insider world, very well connected in this donor community, who tell me, yeah, my my text messages are filled with people who are thinking exactly that way. Like, okay, Biden's collapsing, but it's all good because we've got Bloomberg, and we don't even have to give him any money, right? Even better, <laughs> we don't even have to give him any money, and we still get like to keep the plutocracy. I think it's more of a paper tiger phenomenon, ultimately than a real phenomenon, but I think it's to be taken seriously and not dismissed. And the one, going back to like the Sanders suggestions I would make, and I see them pivoting to do this, is um, they should turn right now and go extremely hard at Michael Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. Like that is that is the pivot to make. You see them laying out the, the talking points about billionaires and turning that focus not only on Pete and his billionaires, but also on Bloomberg and to a lesser extent, Steyer. I think going, super, super hard at Bloomberg 
right away is the way to go. Crystal Ball, I totally agree with you, and I appreciate your time as always. Everybody check out Crystal Ball on Rising on the Hill, and I'll see you soon, Crystal. Sounds good. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right. Uh, welcome back, folks. It's time for the gem. Do you want to try a gem without musical accompaniment, David? Yeah. That'd be All right. Let's see if you can do it without that. <laughs> see if you can handle it. Phase two. Freak out a little bit. All right. Um, yeah. So I wanted to tell um, a story that I've been reading following over the past couple of months, which is a very frightening glimpse into our future. In Nepal, there's been a major failure with their public water systems, and it's basically not able to meet everybody's needs. So throughout these major cities in Nepal, uh, private water carriers and private water tankers have been going around, you know, fulfilling that need. And of course, you know, if people aren't, don't have access to water, we want to make sure that they do. And if the government's failing for that, you know, we're not saying that it's a bad thing for these tankers to be going around. But what's happening on the side is what's frightening. People there are paying rates uh, 10 times higher than any other uh, rate for water in the area. There's been reports that people have been provided with water that is tainted, so people are getting sick. Mm. And one of the most frustrating and damaging aspects of this story has been the fact that some of the providers of this water, so these people are coming around selling their water to people you know, on the free market, have actually been found um, to be destroying pipelines and public water facilities. So they are actually you know, sabotaging the public water system in their area because they want to make a profit. And... You know, climate change is doing serious damage to our water supply. The World Bank has estimated that in the next five years, two thirds of the globe will have difficulty finding clean water to drink. So we're going to be finding this to be much more and more of a problem, you know, around the world and also in the United States. And as this example from Nepal shows that the the profit motive when it comes to providing people with water is something that is very much in opposition uh, to providing people with affordable and uh, safe and clean drinking water. So in the United States, uh, corporations are trying to control as much water as possible. You've seen a massive move uh, towards privatization. Uh, a big part of Trump's uh, infrastructure bill, for example, was actually saying that these cities across the country need to be moving toward uh, water privatization and sell their uh, public utilities to private corporations to provide water for people. And you know, this is something that we've seen around the world, especially in South America. Remember, Evo Morales, uh, one of his first actually like major uh, movements was in the water wars of the early 2000s, where they privatized, uh, they were privatizing water in a major city in Bolivia, and people went on strike to fight against this corporation, an American and a, a, a British corporation, actually, that were trying to take over the water supply. Uh, so we, you know, see that lesson from the early 2000s, and now we're seeing it coming more and more into the United States. Uh, Food and Water Watch uh, found that 59% people who uh, get their water from private sources rather than public sources in the United States are paying 59% more for water service. Um, and immediately after privatization, water rates increase at about three times the rate of inflation with an average increase of 18% every other year. So the price of water is going up for people with privatized water. What these corporations are doing is they're coming to a lot of cities who are struggling and saying, hey, we'll give you, you know, this much money to buy a contract to provide water for your city for the next 30, 40 years. And that gives the city a quick influx of cash, but then leaves the people to pay the higher water bills and are sort of like held hostage by a water corporation for decades on end. Um, you know, companies, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce this uh, French word correctly, but uh, there's a major water corporation called uh, Veolia, uh, V-E-O-L-I-A, which is was a participant in the Flint water crisis. Um, so they were a corporation that was in there and they knew about the damage that was happening to the Flint water system and they didn't say, they didn't do anything about it. And the same thing uh, with Pittsburgh as well. So Trump start, is moving towards uh, privatization. And what we're also seeing is that more and more of these private water companies are sort of joining together. They're lobbying the EPA and they're creating these front groups. And uh, Matt, if you could pull this up, I actually have it up for me, thank you already. Um, you know, they're coming up with these front groups that are trying to push this narrative that there's some dark money plan uh, to protect uh, public water systems from privatization. So I just want to pull this up real quick. It's a it's a company. It's an organization called um, Truth from the Tap. And if you see this, uh, 
you scroll down, if you see this, it's hard to see on here, but if you see this, this chart looks very sinister. But basically what it's saying is that there are people who are anonymous donors, but these are basically people who are you know, donating to organizations like Public Citizen um, or Food and Water Watch or you know, public uh, advocacy organizations. Literally, I mean, just I just want to <laughs> underline this. This is not anonymous. It's great what they're queuing, but you mm -hmm. think, okay, there's some oligarch somewhere and you look up the FEC filings. This is literally like you finally feel bad for some guy on the street asking you to help protect the water. And you're like, all right, here's 20 bucks. That's what they mean. Well, and what's really ironic about this, too, is the way they try to the, what they're trying to imply is that somebody's making a lot of money off of this. Right. When literally this organization is the one that's making a lot of money off of this because it's funded uh, by the National Association of Water Companies, which is the massive lobbying arm for the private water industry. Um, so, you know, they're being very cynical here. But, you know, this is something that's fundamental to capitalism. This is why markets are very bad at uh, providing services ethically for people. Because when you have scarcity and it goes into a market, whoever has the ability to pay the most gets that service. So when we start to see water becoming more scarce, and hopefully that's not going to be the case, but if it does in the United States, if we're operating on a free market system, what we'll see is rich people will still be allowed to water their lawns and waste incredible amounts of water on fancy toilets and pools and whatever the hell. And, you know, people like us won't be able to afford water for drinking, for, you know, cleaning and for cooking. And that's the kind of inequities that are inherent in a capitalist system and are inherent in a market system. And that's why we have for so long have tried to keep the private uh, market outside of our industry and out of our, our water system. Bernie Sanders has made this an important aspect of the Green New Deal. We need to be ever vigilant because they are certainly coming for our water. Without a doubt. And I think we should let yeah, uh, I'll grab her. Malika in. All right, folks. Uh, what we're going to do actually is we're going to take a very brief break and we will be right back with Malika Jabali. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now is a friend of show and somebody who I always introduce as a writer, attorney, an activist. And now I'm going to add documentary filmmaker. I know. Wow. Malika Jabali. Life how are you doing? Fast. I'm really good. Thanks for being here. Thank you. The film is Glad left out. Yes, it is. Um, we're going to play some of it. Uh, do you want to set this up for us a little bit though, please? But, and then we'll play some of it. Well, I don't want to set it up too much. I, I feel like it's self-explanatory. And then I'll, I feel like this is um, like the Daily Show or something. Not the Daily Show, but like a nightly show. This is, I mean, this is the Daily Show when it was, no, it's not really. It, it is a nightly show. Yeah. That's like, the concept, actually. Because Jimmy this Kimmel. This is like a so, night show for you. You could just like, roll the tape. She, she, just, she just went worse than the Daily Show. All right, let's watch some of this. Let's, too far to the left to either win in the midterms or win back the White House. You can't win the White House without the Midwest. Everyone has an opinion about what Midwestern voters want. But which Midwesterners are they talking about? Appeal to these upper Midwest uh, <laughs> right. working class voters. The one group the Democrats most need. Midwestern voters. White Midwest working class voters who deserted the party in 2016. You need to be able to talk to the industrial Midwest. You need to listen to the people there um, and in order to win an election nationwide. And that's exactly what I did. I went we across the on that. Uh, OK, yeah. Up yeah. 40% of the city's population. Mm. Yeah. If they thought policies like Medicare for all or free college tuition were too far left, can't say I had much luck. My first stop was Milwaukee City Hall to talk to Alderman Khalif Rainey. What did he think about these policies being too far left? Yeah, that's absurd. You know, it's a <laughs> preconceived notion that has been uh, developed from quite a distance. Those are simple human needs and human rights, right? Who doesn't want to? a family supporting livable wage earning job. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want access to health care? Uh, I think that's very presumptuous and and that's polite. You know, that's polite. You know, it's actually bizarre and it even brings into question um, are they are they actually Democrats? Free stuff. No, I want you to take it from there. Actually then no, no, I'll do late night show. Malika, are they even Democrats? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It. So Democrats they are. suck. They yeah. are Democrats. That's what they do. So the whole thing is a debunk of these tropes that get put out on television all the time, which 
are either uh, racializing the Midwest in a certain way, but almost always with just the end point that like, oh, do not go out there and talk about giving people health care because average working people, when they're not working like three jobs to survive, they're they're reading The Economist and they're <laughs> concerned about capital gains tax yeah, cuts. Yeah, Wall Street Journal right, right. at their doorstep. So um, what did you find? So as you can see with the, I mean, just the first person who was shown, that's Alderman Califrani. He's uh, it's like the equivalent of a council member in Milwaukee. And I went to his office. He was one of the people who spoke out when there was like a huge um, uprising in, Mil in Milwaukee, a neighborhood called Sherman Park. And I got, you know, I showed some archival footage of people being like, you know, this is a mess. Like we've been dealing with racial disparities, income inequality in this region for decades. And black people have like no wealth. We have no money in this region and somebody needs to do something about it. And so that was in his district where this uprising happened. So I wanted to look at kind of the, the aftermath of all of that. You have all these problems, but then what are some solutions? And you go then, you ask them, well, what can we do about what people are experiencing? And they're like, yeah, we want free health care. Yes, we want free education. This is silly. Who are these people who assume that we don't? Right. Well, who are those people that, they, that assume that they don't? The follow up from, so um, in the following clip, you're going to see a, an assortment of Democrats, uh, Democratic leaders, um, Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, Claire McCaskill, who lost her race. So who is she to say who what can win in the Midwest? Right. <laughs> um, a number of people. So uh, establishment Democrats and pundits assume that these policies won't work there. They think it's just for coastal elites. And they folks are completely baffled. The ones that I talked to, they're baffled as to why this is even an assumption. To what extent, and maybe this isn't even relevant because it gets you to the same place, but I think it's I think it's relevant now because Bernie is like this is real. What what groups of people in the establishment are like literally brainwashed from decades of failure <laughs> and the wrong lessons of Bill Clinton and Obama? Versus like, you know, when someone like Jim Messina comes out and is like, yeah, this won't work. It's like, oh, really, Jim? <laughs> hmm. Let me look at your client page. Yeah. I mean, I think you can look at a, a lot, for a lot of people, it's where they're they're getting their funding, you know, right. where they're getting their donations, you know, from uh, for campaign finance. And there is a dis I think it's a disconnect, one, with what's actually happening on the ground. And two. I don't think that it's beneficial for them to support these things if that's not what you know their donors want to support. So if you're getting paid by pharmaceutical companies, if you're getting paid like or uh, protecting these industries like Joe Biden, um, who you know had some really terrible like advocacy around like consumer debt, um, if you're representing these companies and you're not representing the people and you're not talking to them, can Joe Biden be held accountable for a bankruptcy bill he doesn't remember? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can you you can say that about everything. He probably doesn't remember the crime bill. Right. Like, I mean, this guy literally doesn't remember anything. But like, I feel like. He said he was right there with MLK, you know, marching for civil rights. You so. know, at this point in his career, I believe him. <laughs> you believe that I think he he's was. been lying about it for decades. And now I actually think he does genuinely Some remember rivers. that he was there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm just making senility jokes. Uh, bear with me. So he's got the best false memory. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, right. In all of my false memories, I'm at incredible historical accomplishments. <laughs> my fault. Yeah, I was. I was at this. Of course, I was at the salt march with Gandhi. Yeah. When it comes to people in the Midwest, though, of course they support these policies. Of course, there's going to be basic class consciousness. Do you think like? When you, when you look at like like the one thing that like Sanders isn't doing, and I'll just use it as like a proxy for this conversation, is he's not necessarily turning out a lot of new voters yet. Mm -hmm. That might happen, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's because, I don't think that's because, oh yeah, see, like you're not going to turn out new voters because they're, you know, moderate. Like that's the myth and the lie that you're exposing. Um, but I do think a lot of people for very good reasons, and I actually know people from a very wide array of backgrounds, but the one common factor being like very not rich, they just don't believe. Mm -hmm. They don't believe it can happen. So they support these policies, but they are super reticent about getting involved in any type of thing. Did you encounter that? Um, 
So I don't know what people are thinking for 2020, but there are some young women who I interviewed who at least one of them, you know, she just spoke candidly about not voting in 2016, but she's a part of this like canvassing, it's a um, black leaders organizing communities. She's a part of this political organization to get people more involved in the process. And so I think that is definitely going to continue to be a problem. Like these things aren't going to be fixed overnight. But the basic premise that they don't want these these policies is, you know, it's inaccurate. And it's going to take a lot of organizing kind of outside of the electoral process to be able to say, OK, this can be an option. Because for decades, people didn't find that there were any options through the electoral arena. And it's not going to shift, you know, that quickly. Um, I think Barack Obama was, I mean, unique because... I don't know what his numbers were across the board before black people. It's like, it's historic. Like this has right. never happened before. So that type of excitement is, is unusual. Um, and otherwise I think it's going to just take groundwork and outside of the electoral arena, which is why, you know, I kind of focus on things outside of the electoral process. Well, talk about it. Tell us about that groundwork. Like I mentioned before, uh, black leaders organizing communities, like they do community organizing work at the local to state to federal level. And so you need people who are going door to door for every little small election, whether it's like their own little um, school superintendent race, or if it's about, you know, getting some speed bumps on the road, like these yeah. are local issues that people care about. And if you can get them involved, at least in that space, and they'll start thinking about other ways that they can get involved. And those are the anecdotes that the young woman told me about. So it will like scale up. Right? Yeah, yeah. You just find some way to, to to bring them in, but you know, folks actually have to produce. And you know, if that's not happening across race, like people don't buy into the process. Right. Yeah. I was actually thinking. I was thinking about. I mean, that is one of the most encouraging things now is definitely pe people like Michaela Wilkes or Shahid Buttar who are just like running for Congress, you know, just like being like, no, actually, I don't necessarily want to complain about Steny Hoyer or Nancy Pelosi forever. Yeah. And maybe this could just be done like that kind of momentum. And it always comes out of some type of local organizing component. Yeah. Yeah. That has to be. Um, I think that that's like the groundwork that's important. And that's why I highlighted them. And, you know, to be fair, I think what I think in New Hampshire, there was actually an increase in, in the yeah. voter turnout. I mean, so the yeah. rest remains to be seen. There are a lot of people who are excited about it and it's it's still quite early. So we don't, you know, we don't what know would you say time. to Chris Matthews if you could say anything about this <laughs> <laughs> to Chris Matthews? Um, I there's more. This is like beyond policy for him. There's yeah. like some sort. Uh, well, of you also like need to talk to his imaginary role. friends like. <laughs> He's got people he's got relationships with in his head that probably don't exist anymore. Yeah. He's got some other things that I don't think I can help with. Um, <laughs> he might need some higher interventions there. It's just a little beyond the pale. But what would you, I mean, but like, okay, yeah, obviously he's comedy. But like <laughs> when I'm watching what you made or talking with you about your reporting, it's not like, of course, like I agree with it. So I like it and the arguments make sense to me. But there is something that is so wild about these cliches that could still be spun on television every day when they're just being disproven. Like, I don't have a New York Times column, right? Like, I, you know, look, definitely people watch, they listen, it's out there, it's great. But I, as a fucking YouTube host, could not come out every single show and just say like, this is my baseless cliche. <laughs> I'm going to build every segment around it. And that still happens in the face of like, your reporting's available. <laughs> this documentary's like out there. So what is like that next phase of actually in the media space specifically? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know what it is. Like, I know I, know I learned uh, that, you know, Dr. West as, I mean, this is a small example, but I think it's important. Like when he's at a demonstration somewhere and the press wants to talk to him, he always says, great, I got you, but you're gonna give this person 10 minutes who's a local organizer. Mm -hmm. That's the quid pro quo of getting FaceTime with me as a celebrity, that's great. But like, what is this bigger effort so that, cause Claire McCaskill is gonna say the same thing oh, yeah. on television tonight. Yeah. And it's, we always knew it was wrong, mm -hmm. but you've really shown that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. What's the next kind of layer, I guess, on that national or media level of like actually countering that narrative, you think? Um, I think 
I think it's just going to be a lot of voices. I mean, the same way that you had, you know, these small donors who said that show that the Sanders campaign was viable. I think it's going to take a lot of people who recognize, you know, the the fallacies with the narrative who speak up. Um, one thing, it's kind of related, but not not totally. Like, look at the work that Ben, Dix, ben Dixon has been doing in terms of uh, combating um, the the power of, of Mike Bloomberg's narrative that he's just looking, you know, he's looking out for black people. He's got like, he's got the surge of black support. And he just did a video that went viral. And then the New York Times had to address it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's just mobilizing as many people as possible to say it. And then it can't really be ignored. Because then if you're ignoring it, like that's not you're not doing the base level of kind of reporting for your job if you're ignoring kind of this trend of what the masses are are saying and at least if you're if you are still ignoring it then we're at the phase where we could say you're ignoring it like this or you're not ignoring it you're trying to demonize it i want to play this clip benjamin dixon friend of show uh found this this is great reporting this is an important clip for you because it hits everything you just said. The, let's respond to what Bloomberg actually said, but also watch how CNN tried to spin it mm -hmm. out of the gate. Mm -hmm. We're all the cops and minority neighborhoods. Yes, that's true. Why are we doing is this? Up for that's where all the crime is. And the, the way she got the guns on her kids' hands is uh, to throw them against the wall and frisk them. <laughs> so here's the thing. Important context here. That's it. That's we don't have the full no, tape, pause. so this is. She said, "Here's the thing." <laughs> oh, okay. here's the thing. Yeah, maybe I thought the so here the, the thing is. was definitely well. Maybe it was what he actually said. Let's see. <laughs> so here's the thing. Important context here. We don't have the full tape, so this is obviously snippets that have been released. The podcaster and the writer that released this sound is clearly a Bernie supporter. If you look at his Twitter feed, he's very anti-Bloomberg. He is promoting a hashtag, Bloomberg is a racist. We don't know how he got the sound to begin with. So lots of questions are being asked, especially on the timing of this. As you noted in your introduction, a poll yesterday shows Bloomberg rising in the polls and particularly strong support in the African-American community. He polled at 22 percent, just behind Joe Biden at 27 percent. So the timing here and the mission here all calling into but question. But we also know, right, Christina, that Bloomberg is going to face continued questions That's about his, uh, <laughs> about the stop and frisk policy. Uh, Malika, will you respond to that? And Matt, while Malika responds, would you mind looking up this uh, particular person's biography and telling us where she worked before she worked at CNN? Well, actually, I was going to yeah. mention that. <laughs> okay. Um, but I'll let you, you no, know. No, no, you the... mentioned everything. <laughs> okay, you got it. So she's yes. a Bloomberg reporter. I don't know if she's a former Bloomberg reporter or she still represents the company. <laughs> But that, here's the thing. Here's the thing from this <laughs> random person who just came from nowhere right. to address this issue. Um, so she has worked with the company at some point, and Ben Dixon has not been, you know, quiet about, you know, where his his you know interests lie, where his priorities lie in terms of kind of progressive advocacy. But none of that addresses the actual tape. This is these are the words that are coming out of his mouth. <laughs> we can hear it. So how do we address that? And so the fact that this is the the angle that they start with about something that is so draconian and dehumanizing and the way that it's framed as just some sort of biased, you know, gotcha instead of something that caused harm for years for hundreds of thousands of people of color. And that is not treated with that kind of urgency. That should tell you something about where our media is right now. And the only way, I mean, I'm not even trying to be flippant, right? The only way for that quote to have been taken out of context is if he would said, I would be a fucking racist monster to say. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like what, what way does that quote get cleaned up in context? That's the thing is there was zero way she could address the actual content of that. So she has to go to the source. Yeah. There's no other right. way to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So talk about let's let's hit on let's talk about Bloomberg a little bit. And and there's a whole like that's the worst one, but there is a whole treasure trove of lines about this guy. Um We've got actually. Let's is one more from Ben Dixon. Let's let's play on that, and then at the same time, this is released. Uh, Gregory Meeks, the fourth member of the Congressional Black Caucus, endorsed him. He's getting a slew of mayors. Um, 
he's hiring talent across the board. Money is money. Um, but let's play one more from Benjamin Dixon. And then I want you to talk about this dynamic of how Bloomberg's inserting himself into mm-hmm. the race. You've made some reference to the elements that led to where we are today. Could, could you go a little bit deeper and tell us from your perspective, how did we get here? What are the root causes of the well, crisis? That y- you can go back. I, w- I would say it probably all started back uh, when there was a lot of pressure on banks to make loans to everyone. Um, redlining, if you remember, was the term where banks took hold neighborhoods and said, uh, people in these neighborhoods are poor, they're not going to be able to pay off their mortgages, tell them well, your salesmen don't go into those areas. And then Congress got involved, as local elected officials as well, and said, oh, that's not fair, these people should be able to get credit. And once you started pushing in that direction, banks started making more and more loans where the credit of the person buying the house wasn't as good as you would like. Yeah, Here's the thing. That's our bloomy. That's our bloomy. <laughs> it's all there. Yeah, I mean, and there's there's so much. And we've lived in New York City. You know, the, the, the show is based in New York City. I've been here for a decade. We can see what his zoning policy has done to New York in terms of creating... These, these immense amount of luxury developments that are vacant, like 30% of them are yep. vacant, and homelessness is like at a crisis right now. Creating luxury development that all has also transformed like places like Williamsburg, um, just put gentrification on overdrive, cut out manufacturing in so many of you know the, the communities that were giving people jobs in the city. And he did not want it to be a manufacturing city anymore. No. No, so no, he, no. you know, had a lot of luxury, you know, just all these deals with real estate developers to put it on hyperspeed. So, I mean, there's so much wrong with his campaign. It's almost like he's the flip side of Donald Trump uh, because he's a, you know, he's, he's, I just want, no, he's, he's literally the flip side of Donald Trump. Yeah. Like I want to really hit that for people. He yeah. is, I mean, that you are choosing between two paths of formalized authoritarianism in that race. And people should not minimize that at all. Yeah. I mean, the sort of fascism that we talk about relating to Donald Trump, Bloomberg actually implemented in New York City. And so the only reason why people are discussing it less is because he's kind of offering patronage jobs to liberals. A lot of his support is coming from him going into these cities. And if you just look at almost every endorsement that I've seen thus far, if you go back four weeks, a month or two, you can see where he's gone to these cities and he's made some grand speech about we need to put more resources into these struggling towns and communities and giving some people jobs in exchange for their endorsement. Um, there's a, a young uh, congressional candidate right now out of Florida, Elijah Manley, who put on Twitter today or sometime you know, over the last couple of days that could he was could offered. Could you guys look for that? It's Elijah Manley on Twitter. Sorry, he was Glenn. offered, I think, $6,500 a month. And he's like, you know, he's like 20 years old, so that sounds amazing, $6,500 a month to be a senior advisor for the Bloomberg campaign. That's a lot of money that he's just kind of throwing out there. It's, to some, for someone we don't even you know, know, but he just wants all these black faces. So to me, right. this is just kind of the, the peak of the sort of cynical represent, representational politics. Instead of real kind of getting at justice work, getting at inequality. You just put kind of black faces in front of your campaign and you say, oh, I'm about black people. And some folks, you know, think that that is meaningful. Right. Right. This is uh, Elijah Manley. Um, I received a call from Bloomberg campaign last week offering me, yeah, like you say, 6500 a month with benefits for an advisory role. That's 100% more than I'm making now. My answer, of course, is no, I'm with Bernie Sanders. They're out here stealing people, y'all. And and by the way, uh, Chuck Rocha, and I believe completely he's an advisor for the Sanders campaign, he said on the Hill that he, he had a conversation with a local organizer who said, look, I can't turn down this offer. I'm still going to vote for Bernie, and I'm with you, but... Yeah, I got to pretend to take this job. And that's amazing, right? Because it makes total sense. Like you can he can play like he can play people who are good and want to get really good. And then he can also just exploit the total lack of infrastructure to support people doing work like Elijah Manley's doing. And that's like the other like very specific hole on like the left, quote unquote. In terms of having like the resources to be yeah. able to yeah. influence things. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what happens <laughs> under capitalism. And it's a right. cycle because people are, are struggling. They're suffering. You know, I have friends who want to do good, you know, law work. 
but they have to work for kind of these big law firms, A, to pay back their loans and to just be able to live in New York City. And so it just kind of repeats the cycle of supporting, you know, these these elite interests um, and these oligarchs who then can control kind of everybody else and <laughs> and politics. And that's that's a, a huge problem. But at the same time, I think when he actually gets out and has a debate and he has to confront his record, I always believe in kind of the power of the people. Mm. I feel mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. where we are right now, people are not gonna let this kind of thing slide. He's had to answer to his campaign based on you know a podcaster <laughs> finding some information on YouTube and, and putting it out there. And so I'm getting like press releases saying, oh, well, I, you know, from like the Bloomberg campaign, like I apologize for this work. So they have to, you know, address their their misgivings. And he tried to say he inherited it from Giuliani. Yeah. And of course, the actual numbers are that he spiked it from Giuliani. Seven times. So this dude has a more racist specific area than Rudy Giuliani. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I do think that the information gets out there. It's going to be a major problem for him. And, and let's play this uh, real quick. Or wait, this is uh, let's let's find the clip of the woman protesting him. Oh, this is it. OK, this is great. <laughs> and everybody should be doing this everywhere yeah. he goes, yeah. particularly if you're a little old lady like this. Cause, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's a Bernie bro. It's going to take less. <laughs> she is a Bernie bro. Bernie bro is a state of mind. Matt. <laughs> We've got some uh, interstitial. A little bit deeper and tell us. <laughs> Are you listening to a motivational okay, record in the background or something? Oh, All right. Yeah, let's play this real quick. This is important. This is exactly what Malik is talking about. My breath. <laughs> I am that excited. That is not democracy. That is plutocracy. Awesome. Let's play it one more time. I love it. I am that excited. I love her. It's trying to work. That is plutocracy. Yes. Yes. Gives her a hug. <laughs> He's trying to lead her like she's like a cat or something. <laughs> What kind of stand do you need to be? You know, let me. This is. Let me just say, this is me. I'm very cynical. But if you were in that crowd, booing this old lady off of the stage for saying the obvious and doing so courageously, you better be on Bloomberg's books because if you're not, that's fucking pathetic. Why are Bloomberg voters so uncivil? Honestly, well, that's number one. Is that they're totally I guess an old lady? Jeez. Ugh, ugh. <laughs> not a good look, guys. <laughs> if this is the hill you want to die in, I guess. <laughs> I love that she went up there with her little shopping bag. She was like, I'm she, like, she just came straight from the grocery store. It's like, oh, that mic's open. Yeah, right. mic's open. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just run up in this campaign real quick. I love it. Will you stay with us for a little bit of the post game? Sure. Fantastic. All right, we're gonna talk more Bloomberg in the post game because we're gonna just just omnibus all of these clips on every single area. We didn't even play what this guy said about spying on Muslims. <laughs> and let me, and also I wanna say here, I mean, this is, this is a history, like go back to a program like Bossy, I think that Bossy Bossy, which was essentially the NYPD unit that spied on people like Malcolm X, that in my editorial definitely had a hand in his assassination as but one of innumerable examples and realize that to the extent that those programs were even t slightly rolled back, Mike Bloomberg reamped them, created a mini CIA department, and literally spied on kids on a whitewater rafting trip. And when confronted with this, was just like, hey, it's a dangerous world. So, you know, and that go and then, you know, poor people should pay taxes. I don't support raising the minimum wage. I mean, there's no other way besides an oligarch of describing this person as other than an authoritarian Republican. I mean, I mean, it really is like through the looking glass to be like, 
I, I actually I can even understand the mentality of any trash Democrat is not Donald Trump. But this isn't any trash Democrat. This is a fucking Republican. So we will talk about him more. And it's very important. You know, we want to game these YouTube algorithms. Because look, he's got an unending amount of money to spend. And they do, they have good analytics. They know where to target it. They know how to talk about it. And if the work of Benjamin Dixon and others isn't highlighted, the media will certainly give him a pass. And we could have a real problem. But Malika, before all of that, how can people find your documentary? You can go on YouTube and Google, or not Google, but put it in the YouTube search bar, <laughs> left out. <laughs> and it's on my my channel. Um, so you guys have my name up there. So if you put in YouTube and Malika Jabali, it'll pop up. There'll be all the ways you can find. Now, are you going to be doing more uh, documentaries on that channel or what's the plans for that? I have no idea. It was so much work, y'all. Like, I believe. It is it was, true that, no. that, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mike yeah. Bloomberg is hosting the Left Out Viewing with you? <laughs> <laughs> How do you think I pay for Mike Tabs? He's just like yeah. <laughs> sponsoring my existence right yeah, now. Yeah, he's just like, oh, sure, Left Out. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Um, it, how, yeah, I can't. Every person has ever told me about making a documentary. It sounds like one of the most exhausting processes imaginable. It's a lot. I mean, and it's and there wasn't like a clear way to distribute this because uh, it's a short. So, you know, it's not like it's making money. It's just there for the people, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but that cost. So I had to basically do it was like a very steep learning curve. I had to learn how to edit. I was like, I don't know how to fucking edit. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, you edited it? Like, do you, yes. do you edit it nice. yourself? I sound mixed. I was like, I don't. You That's know, incredible. I just came up with the idea. I was like, it's got to happen. Can I have the soundboard? I don't normally do this, but let me. Got it. Yeah. I want to recommend something. Um, and when you do this, it's extremely important that you be highly polite. But anytime you see a segment or you see somebody tweet, or maybe you just know somebody's brand is built off of talking about what voters in the Midwest want or whatever else, maybe it's Claire McCaskill, maybe it's the guy who wrote Hillbilly Elegy or some other garbage, but don't say that. Just when you see them on social media, just tweet malika's doc at them and cc her on and say like hey i think you should check this out have you considered this? have you considered this perspective be extremely polite <laughs> tweet it at her and get the information in front of them and you know i've actually seen engagement work like that for some things especially because this is short so there's way yeah, less of an excuse yeah yeah you have seven <laughs> minutes in between making up a poll result in your head <laughs> to watch a mini doc so i'd recommend you do it Everybody should watch this. Um, Malika, thanks as always. We'll Thank see you, you um, for the first part of the post game. Great. Everybody, patreon.com slash TMBS. Join today. We're continuing to grow at a very fast rate. And that's going to allow us to make our next moves. We appreciate all of you. Come see us April 3rd in Austin, Texas with Anna Kasparian and Abby Martin. That's going to be a really good show. And then we'll announce pretty soon the next show after that's going to be in Boston. Um, and a couple of other things on the docket. Next week, we're on vacation, but there's going to be new conversations that are going to be released with Adolf Reed Jr. and Aaron Bastani uh, and some other great content. We appreciate each and every one of you. I want to thank the team. I want to thank the community. Peace and love. See you in the postgame.